On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany. The Thomas Morse S-4C Scout was a late war American advanced fighter trainer. The plane, nicknamed the Tommy, saw extensive service across the U.S. and had a post-war career in movies. It wasn't long before hundreds of young flying cadets, wearing identifying white bands on their hats, began reporting to flying schools in the United States, Canada, and Europe. The U.S. struggled to build up-to-date aircraft as other nations far outpaced American aviation technology and production. For advanced single-seat pursuit training, many pilots had to go to Europe. In 1918, however, the Thomas Morse S-4C Scout became readily available for training American fighter pilots at home. It represented a small step forward in aviation manufacturing independence. The basic S-4 model, designed in 1916 and built in Ithaca, New York, flew in 1917 and with refinement became a serviceable trainer. The Army bought about 500 S-4Cs and around 250 saw domestic service during the war. Museum technicians spent approximately two years to completely restore this aircraft. We go through the galleries and we assess condition. And when you see one like the Scout that had a big split right down the belly of the airplane, it's like, okay, this one needs to come sooner than later on the schedule to be restored. That split in looking in the airplane taking fabric off was caused by oil that was leaking out of the oil tank, dripped down on the fabric, ran back the whole length of the fuselage, and that weakened that cotton and caused it to just split apart. And there's a cowling panel that goes underneath the airplane and it's referred to as the oil pan. So anything that would drip down would be caught basically by that and that would have prevented that big old split from being in the aircraft. So we took it off display in, uh, two years ago. Um, it was during the time that we were, had finished the uh, Avro 504 and we had an empty space on the floor that we could then take the Scout off of the poles that it's on, set it down, disassemble it, and remove the airplane. Took it back over to restoration, and it actually sat in restoration for about a half a year without much being done to it because this restoration was a little different than the rest because the pandemic hit right about the time we took the airplane over. We were able to come back to work, but we had to do a, a few other prioritized things while nobody was here at the museum. Uh, once that was taken care of and people were starting to come back into their little bit normal routine, I guess, we started back on the Scout. So the, the process involves uh, fully documenting everything you have in the condition the airplane's at then we can remove all the fabric and we want to get in to see what the structure looks like. Uh, once we have all the fabric removed and all the pieces disassembled, we can then uh, document all of that to keep that as a record. Then we can start cleaning things and then start repairing things. So once you have everything taken apart, everything's cleaned, everything's repaired, then that can be when, when you start actually fabricating new pieces that you need and then uh, prepping those parts that have been repaired to last for their long journey that they're going to be on. So you clean the, the wood structures and now you need to put new varnish on it. So we would re-varnish structures that had to be. We would do whatever we could to save the old varnish that was on parts that were fine. It seals the wood in, but it's also your protective coat so that the uh, belt doesn't stick to the wood. Uh, like the, a lot of the fuselage was that way. After you fabricate your parts, put your varnish on, get it all ready to go, then the fabric starts. So we uh, cut, measure, uh, drape the fabric on the parts, sew it all together. Once it's sewn, then we have to, uh, once it's machine sewn, then we have to hand sew any of the parts where it tucks in and finishes it off. Then we go in with the uh, process that's known as doping, which is actually a structural adhesive that goes on in the airplane. So that gets brushed on. Uh, you get about four or five coats of that. These are the tail surfaces off the Thomas Morse Scout. Uh, they have one coat of 50-50 applied to them of the nitrate. 
Uh, so we're just starting to see the process. It'll, when you first do it, it'll get really baggy and it gets kind of scary. But after you get a couple more coats on there, it really starts to, to tighten down. This airplane gets the uh, insignias of the time. Now there were two different ones. There were ones that were just round L's that they would use when they were over in the actual the war. Uh, this airplane served in the United States and during its time period it gets the uh, circle with the white star and then the red circle inside of that. So on this airplane I hand painted those all on there. I was able to uh, cut out a template out of a cardboard type material. I was able to trace that out on the wings and then actually hand paint it all in with the brush. When it comes down to putting the finish on it, doing the insignia, doing the numbers, that is absolutely my favorite part because that's when the airplane really starts to look like what you see in the pictures. It transforms it from this uh, blank form, basically, to what it is in my mind, at least, of what it's supposed to be. Once that's all done, then you can go in with your color and really start to, to make the airplane look like what it's supposed to. Brian is absolutely a wizard at doing this sheet metal stuff. He's, he was able to patch in the, the pieces that have been cut out, replicate the rolled edge that's on the cowling. All the dents, he was able to, to knock all those dents back out, able to smooth it out, get the finishes on it, and it, it looks like a brand new cowling, but it is the cowling from the airplane. It's the original one, so that preserving, preserving those original parts is crucial to preserving what that aircraft did. The airplane had been changed at certain times where someone had shoved the cowling farther back on the aircraft. So there's a stop ring that goes in the cowling, they had moved that, they had cut spots out in the cowling for it to go around the cabane struts. So all that had to be repaired so we could get it back in the proper position. Uh, there's a metal aluminum ring that gets attached on the inside as a stop for when it gets slid onto the airplane. And uh, in the past they've had it on in different locations. So wherever we need it to go, I'll have to fill the other holes. And basically, like I did a patch, it'll just be a, a rivet squeezed in there to make it go away. I mean, we're gonna make it look as smooth as possible. Because it's an original cowling, and we, we're going to work with this one instead of trying to get another one made. It's kind of exciting as far as the CMI, the colors, markings, and insignia. Because the rudder gets a red, white, and blue stripes. So instead of just the, the English khaki gray everywhere. So it was fun painting the painting the stripes on there and then it gets also the aircraft numbers. So I got to lay out the little aircraft numbers on there and hand paint those on and it really makes a nice look when it's done. What is it you're doing Adam? These are the brackets for the uh, hinge pin. So there's a big giant pin that goes all the way down in here. On the fuselage, the, the style, the font of the numbers do not match the numbers on the tail. And that's the way it is in, in all the period photographs. So it's, you have to recreate that. You may not agree with it, but it, it creates a cool look. And throughout the process, uh, Wes Henry and research was able to find a photograph of the airplane right after ours. So it was uh, 38945. So ours is 38944. So I was really happy to find that because I was able to rely on this uh, one or two pictures of this airplane and focus on you know what style or the numbers supposed to be on the side which when you look at different S4Bs and S4Cs the numbers on the side vary a lot it, the the style of the font that they are the thickness of the of the stroke for the numbers so I had a, a reference photo one airplane after ours that I was able to really say you know this is most likely what ours was would have looked like It has four instruments, uh, five if you count the, the fuel indicator for the tank. We were able to find those down in collections. It's the, the type that should be in it. So um, in having to make a new instrument panel, because the instrument panel we had was incorrect, uh, we were able to fit the original style instruments in there. So that's what's in the aircraft now, and they, they look great because it matches pictures that I have from 
you know, the 1918, 1920s, and it's like, wow, this is what it's supposed to look like. So we have original instruments. The two upper wings on this aircraft, uh, you have your right wing, your left wing, and they they just come together. There's there's no center section. A lot of the airplanes that we deal with, they have a small little uh, center cabane section that the wings hook onto. Well, these, it's just wing to wing. Um, one of the wings has two male fittings. The other wing has two female fittings. They just come together and you get two bolts. And that's what holds the, the two upper wings together is just two bolts. Overlooked with these airplanes is, okay, you got wooden fabric and that's the airplane. Well, a really integral part of the structure is all the, the cables that are connecting everything. That's what's really uh, dissipating and carrying all the load from the airplane because uh, you got wires for flying wires, you got wires for landing wires, you know, it, it all spreads that weight out evenly so that makes it a really strong structure. Even on the fuselage you have, it's basically a box structure of all this wood with little metal fittings that hold it together, but there are wires running between all that and you you tension those wires you basically tune the wires to the right tension they need to be and that's what makes that structure really strong but also light one of the really fun parts is one of the last pieces you put on which is typically the propeller uh, we put it on last because it's usually in the way when you're trying to work on everything else uh, so that's a that's a really nice finishing touch to see that propeller go on the airplane, and it and it's just like the crowning jewel basically. A lot of fun. When it goes outside for its official photos for the museum, that that's a big time for me, and I, I would assume for the other guys on the project because that's the moment when it's like okay, it's done, and it and it is awesome. Um, you see the airplane the entire time you're working on it inside a building. It's under artificial light. You know it's. It's just the, the way it is. But when you take it out in sunlight, then it starts to look like these pictures that you've seen because they're, all the pictures are taken outside and it, it really makes the colors pop. It makes it look amazing. So it's just a really nice feeling to, to know that it's, it's getting its beauty photos, its glamour shots, and it's, it's about to go in the museum and, and be ready for everybody to see. Once it goes in the museum, it, it kind of affects people. It touches people. Uh, is an honor to the veterans that served in the military and, and actually flew on these airplanes and repaired these airplanes and it, it's just really great to be a part of that to to put that on display to to honor everything that they've done and then to see people now uh, connecting with that and being able to to understand in some way what people went through back then it's it's great to be part of that <laughs>